All right, guys, the Russian Revolution here. Um, we've looked at the other revolutions, you know, French Revolution, Haiti, South America, Mexico, even the Industrial Revolution. Well, the Russian Revolution is a little bit different and slightly complicated. It happens in the midst of World War I. And if you see the three guys here on the slide, um, we got Joseph Stalin in the middle of Vladimir Lenin, the guy on the far side, his good buddy, Leon Trotsky. And the Russian Revolution was not planned or led by any single faction. It comes in part, if you know, when we talk about Russian nationalism, by the complete and total failure of the Tsarist government to competently run the enormous country of Russia. So we've got poor leadership, we've got incompetent leaders, coupled with the military failures and the massacres of World War I. Hundreds of thousands of millions of dead, wounded, and missing soldiers. Added to that, the industrial workers were starving and ready to go on strike. And so for a quick review, if we go back to 1905, a revolution occurs in Russia. And the hope is that Tsar Nicholas II would change the entire Russian government from the authoritarian absolutism into a democratic republic. And many different groups protested this throughout the country. There were economic strikes, there were student-led rebellions, and even terrorist attacks and assassination attempts on the czars. There was also a group, or a few groups, pushing for a new Russian constitution. And as a result of the Russian Revolution, in 1905, one of the most weird full reforms was made, and that is the creation of a thing known as the Duma, the D-U-M-A. The Duma was kind of like a Congress, a legislature, except it had no power whatsoever. And the members of the Duma set up tiny, temporary governments um, in the provinces, run mostly by middle-class people, hard-working middle-class people. Now, these middle-class people, for the first time, get a taste of self-government. And they want reforms. And they want a constitution like everybody else in the West has, or what would become a new democratic republic. Then we jump nine or ten years into the future, and we're in 1914. When World War I breaks out, Russia and its empire was massive. Again, it stretches from the Pacific Ocean in the east all the way to the Baltic Sea in Europe. Large country, natural resources, but also a large and vastly diverse population. But when you look at it in compared to the increasingly industrialized West, Russia was in slow motion. Like they were spinning their tires and their muds were caught in a tar pit. They're, they're moving, but they're not going anywhere. They are still a country where the government was based on feudalism. Feudalism had died out everywhere else in Europe, and they're still clinging to it. And most of the populations in Russia were poor peasants. There was a tiny, tiny middle class emerging as Russia was just starting to industrialize. Just getting there. Everyone else was there, you know, going back to 1750. Even Japan has done more. But some czars had made a few reforms up to this point, but not much. Nothing was done to improve the lives of the poor Russian citizens who want something more. And the current czar, Nicholas II, if we go back to nationalism, um, did, not make, did not want to make any change that could threaten or endanger the power of the Romanov family. 
He wanted to stay as the king. And while holding vastly to this belief, his country had become corrupt and had not changed the way it had done things in hundreds of years. And so World War I starts, and it reignites briefly the ideas of Russian patriotism and nationalism, where Russian were great, and it brings the Russians together. But after a few early victories, things began to fall apart. And the Russian army is just, they take an epic beatdown in the small village of Tannenberg, where the Germans will kill and capture hundreds of thousands of Russians. Nearly two million are killed, missing, and wounded. With the total loss in manpower, the Russian new industry could not keep up with the demand for war products. They couldn't make them fast enough. They simply did not have enough resources, an efficient way to make weapons. So by 1915, the Russian soldiers are poorly equipped, poorly trained, and even more poorly led. So in early 1915, the people of St. Petersburg, a town built by the greatest Romanov of them all, began to strike. And what we always do in Russia at this point is we send out the army troops to stop the riots. But don't fire into the crowds. And for the first time ever in Russia, the soldiers literally don't fire on the protesters, and some of them even join. Two years later, by 1917, the Russians had endured horrific millions of casualties. The war was going badly. The leadership was poor. The Tsar had left to go out and take charge, leaving the Tsarina, his wife, in charge, and she or in power back in the city, and she was a German, so we can't trust her. So in February of 1917, things are going to happen. The difficulties on the battlefield were even worse when the Tsar went to take a look. Things aren't getting better. To the people back at home, told him they have to sacrifice for the war effort. There's not enough food. There's not enough fuel. There's nothing for the people. And this brings about the end of the great Romanov dynasty. As the workers go on strike in St. Petersburg, shouting for food, shouting for jobs, when the soldiers for the first time refused to fire on them, the government realized it was helpless. With his advisors telling him what to do, Tsar Nicholas II abdicates the throne, steps down, and asks permission for amnesty from his cousin in England, King George. On March 15th, the Ides of March 1917, the Duma was dissolved. And the government in Russia falls into the hands of separate governments, one in each province. Some of these problems sympathized with the West and wanted to undergo reforms, continue World War I and uphold our alliance. Others wanted to withdraw from the war and just tap out. And they organized the common workers into groups known as Soviets. This is what the Soviets are going to do. And the problem with the Soviets was instead of focusing on their internal problems, the real problems facing Russia, these provincial governments thought it best to uphold their alliance and keep fighting Germany, which I get your passion and your idea, that's great. However, the majority of Russians had had enough of war. And the problems at the front caused many of the Russian soldiers to abandon their military units. They just dropped their stuff and they went home. And as they get to the urban areas, there's no food. The people want relief from hunger. Problem was, most of the food was being sent to the army. So some of the provincial governments are going to stick with the alliance and continue to fight. And in 1917, a massive offensive was, was hailed as the savior, and it miserably failed. And that failure and continue hunger and fuel shortages dooms these provincial governments and creates 
the Soviets, the Soviet experiment. Now, working against these provincial governments were a group of people who believed in Karl Marx's ideas of socialism. And they wanted a different path from Russia than the Western provinces. And they go out amongst the common people, amongst the peasant farmers. And they call these people the proletariat. Remember from the Industrial Revolution, the industrial workers, the iron ore miners, the coal miners. And they tried to get the proletariat to prime them to lead a revolution. And they, you people, you proletariat, are Soviets, common people. And an active member of the Soviets are known as the Bolsheviks. They were probably the most radical social group in Russia. Remember this joke on the exam? You can't trust a communist because they're full of Bolshevik. There it is. That's pretty funny. Remember it out there in AP world land? Because the communist governments, you know, they're just not doing well. It just doesn't work. And the leader of the Bolshevik party is none other than this little guy here, Vladimir Lenin. Now, Lenin was born to a wealthy upper middle class family, but his brother winds up being executed by the Tsarist government. When that happens, Vladimir Lenin says, that's it, I'm going to find a way to overthrow the Tsarist regime. And as he reads Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto, he is really, really influenced by that. And he works tirelessly amongst the students and the urban workers to spread Marxist ideas and the idea of socialism. And what makes Lenin so important and powerful was that he was able to change the Marxist thoughts and philosophies and get them to meld with events happening in Russia. All right, so we're going to take what's happening and we're going to twist it a little bit. And Marx had said that the working classes need to unite and overthrow the corrupt, greedy capitalists. It's the capitalists that are beating you down. The capitalists that just want money, and that's who's profiting from this war. The difference for Russia was Russia doesn't have a large number of industrialized workers who believe this yet. They just don't have a lot of industry, so it's hard to get collectives to believe this. So Lenin wanted a small, tiny portion of, of Soviets to lead the re revolution. Excuse me. Then he would create a mechanism of leadership that would govern the proletariat. So I want a small force of you to lead the revolution. Then I, because remember socialism, you get what you need based on your talents and your needs. But somebody's got to determine that. That's going to be Lenin. And Lenin picks the name Bolshevik because it means majority. All right, It means majority rules. But however... It's not a majority. It just sounds good. It's a PR marketing campaign. Lenin made it seem as if everybody in the country wanted this. And as a result of his agitation, the people of the Russian government exile him to Switzerland, where he stays. He's there for a long time. But in 1917, the Bolshevik socialists organized themselves, and they were trying to work against the democratic provincial governments. In order to help their war effort against Russia in a beautiful bit of subterfuge, the German government helped smuggle and sneak Vladimir Lenin back into Russia from exile, just hoping he would cause further problems. They didn't care what he did as long as he distracted the Russian war effort. Lenin gets off the train in St. Petersburg. Babas, blue, blue, Prevet comrade, I am here, I am Lenin. And he meets his supporters. And he holds the, the 1917 version of a press conference and he says that all governmental power should go to the Soviets. In other words, all power should go to my boy Bob in the GM factory. That's who should be in charge, the common workers. And Lenin 
Launch is a failed coup. All right, very similar to Simon Bolivar who gets exiled, even more on Hitler in Germany. And Lenin and his right-hand man, this little guy here, Leon Trotsky, are exiled and thrown into jail. Hmm. But the exile doesn't last long this time because Lenin is back in the fall of 1917 because the war effort is going bad. And people are like, Lenin, Lenin, Lenin. And November 6, 1917, Lenin leads the Bolshevik Revolution as they destroyed an attempt at common elections. At this point, Lenin demands that all worker or all um, land be turned over to the peasants. All factories be turned over to the workers and the soldiers. And we're going to seize the banks and take the money, and we are going to give it to the people who needed it. Churches are closed. And Lenin was supported in the background by Germany. So he was forced to sign an armistice with them. And the armistice will be really costly for Russia as they had to give up territory to Germany. And they had to pay large war damages. And this was difficult for Lenin, but Lenin needs time to consolidate his power. He needs time to get things organized as civil war was about to break out in Russia. And there's a revolution between the Red Russians, who will support Vladimir Lenin and communism, and White Russians, who oppose the Bolsheviks. And while Lenin focuses on expanding the revolution, he worked with his buddy Leon Trotsky, who is a firm believer in Marxist ideas. And he promises the people three things, three simple things, peace, land and bread. We will have peace with Germany, you will have land, and you will have food to eat. Peace, land, and bread. Now this sounded great to the starving Russian people. This was just fantastic. They were tired of war. And it's the summer of 1917 and the provincial governments try their last gasp attempt, that big offensive, to get people into their side, and it failed. And so the troops refuse to keep fighting. And they're getting ready to go home to another cold, freezing Russian winter. And Lenin and his Bolsheviks use this sense of despair to persuade people as a vehicle to launch him into power. And with the Bolsheviks in control, Lenin's ideas grow. Factory workers begin to arm themselves, and they call themselves the Red Guard. Think of the elite protectors of Emperor Palpatine in Star Wars. Their numbers grow as sailors from the Russian Navy join up. They openly attack provincial governments. And while um, there was a meeting in the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg, the provincial government surrender. It's clear they no longer had any support and power whatsoever. And so while Trotsky is saying peace, land, and bread, this unfortunately is the end of peace in Russia for quite some time. The Bolsheviks move into the capital, or move the capital from St. Petersburg to Moscow. <coughs> they make the Kremlin a walled fortress, their new headquarters. And it's here where Lenin declares the Russians are going to set up a proletarian socialist state. No more private ownership of um, property. Large industrial factories, GM, will be turned over to Bob and the peasants. And all of this sounds good to the peasants, it sounds great, for the first time, they thought they were going to get a say so that they were going to be in charge. And this new government takes the name communist. But unfortunately, as we all know, for the peasants, the communists were soon going to dominate them. They changed one autocratic government for another. 
And a civil war begins raging in Russia um, from 1918 to 1921. We have the battle of the white Russians and the red Russians. If one of you sees this and asks me to tell you about Dr. Zhivago, remind me and I will. The battle ravages the countryside. The red army or the communists battle the white army and the Russian people who do not like the communist revolution and remain loyal to the Tsar are known as white Russians. Some members did not like the Tsarist regime, but they didn't like communism and Lenin either. And during the Civil War, the newly industrialized Japan captures some Russian territory in 1918. And this prompts some of the allies in World War I, like England, France, and the United States, to help the white Russians combat the communists. Here's aid, here's money, here's weapons, do something. However, the cost was high on both sides as, as they both demonstrate they will go to whatever lengths it'll take to win this war. We'll do whatever. The white army even tries to assassinate Vladimir Lenin. And they began the age-old policy of executing prisoners. Well, when the Red Army hears of this, what do they do? The Red Army goes on a French Revolution-like reign of terror, where they just execute anybody and everybody, Russian peasants, even if it was just a rumor they were non-communist, they were killed. The most famous part of this is when the Romanov family, who was given amnesty in England, the Tsar and his family, well, the kids got the measles. And while they had the measles, a socialist revolution or protest had broken out in England, so King George revoked the amnesty, and the entire Tsarist Romanov family, the royal family, not every Romanov, but the royal family, were killed. And during the fighting, the Red Army takes over all industrial mines, factories, and they sought to control all heavy industry and railroads, shipping, you name it. And the peasants had to shoulder the burden of all of this. They were forced to give anything extra they had to the Red Army, who was then feeding themselves and giving food to people in the large urban cities who supported them. So the poor peasant farmers are losing again. And while the peasants were not happy about this, what could they do? And Leon Trotsky had been training a peasant communist army into a reliable fighting force. And his main speech was like Bismarck's. It was patriotism. Be proud of Russia. Be proud of vodka and caviar and borscht and Fabergé eggs and babushka dolls. Here is a reason to fight. And as the result of the brutal tactics of the white Russians and Trotsky's impassioned speeches, the communist Red Army defeats the white army in 1921. With the Red Army victorious, that's great, but there's still a lot of problems. Millions have died from a combination of World War I, the Civil War, and starvation. Russian industry was inefficient, it still didn't work. The landscape had been pillaged, and Lenin had put himself in the central place to solve all of these problems and build a new Russia. So he's got his moment, he's ready. Okay, Lenin, what are you going to do now? And Lenin, to be fair to a communist, works tirelessly to try and reshape Russia. His ultimate end game was to develop this perfect communist utopian society where there was no social class system. Society was going to be governed by the people. For the very first time, the people were in control of the capital and the proletariat would determine everything. Industrial production, who and how the land was going to be used and by whom. They were going to rebuild Russia. And while Lenin tries really hard to capitalize on this goal, 
he never really completes it. He just can't. In 1922, his government creates a new constitution where all political power and all resources for production belong to the worker, to Bob. And anyone over the age of 18 could vote. However, it's all an illusion. It's Lenin and his Communist Party who run the show. And on December 30th, 1922, Russia becomes known as the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And now we get to these things that we're going to call NEPs, New Economic Policies. As Lenin began to build this utopian society, he's focusing on his economy which was near complete and total failure, like nothing was working. His policies weren't working. You know, people were like, oh my God, look at that communism, it's great. If you popped your head beneath the glossy surface, you're like, dude, what the hell is going on over there? His earlier policies weren't working at all. And some peasants had said, you know what, if I farm and I'm not allowed to keep what I grow, I've got to give it away and my family starves, then heck with it. I'm not even going to farm. Everything that I make is going to be confiscated by the government. So Lenin changes and he implements things on his new, e new NEPs or new economic policies. And he takes a lot of heat for this. This was a shift from the utopian ideological Marxist views. And Karl Marx himself said, look, it's just... A theory, there's no science to prove it. And under the NEPs, most things essential to the government would be run by the government. The government is going to control those things. However, non-essential businesses, things that aren't necessary for the country, you could sell those things for a profit. These are the tiny, small local private businesses, like the local candlestick maker and the local butcher. And to appease the farmers who were ready to mutiny, they were able to sell any surplus food or grain that they had for personal profit. So if you grow it, you can sell it. Now you have an incentive. And while he takes criticism for this early on, by the end of the 1920s, the economy's not doing bad again. And Lenin thought the new economic policies would be a temporary solution, but it looks as if they're going to stay. But his views are called anti-Marxist, and he's like, duh, it was just a theory. And then, unfortunately, before these things take root, Vladimir Lenin dies in 1924. Before his plans could be realized, and this is a terrible thing for the people of Russia, his death creates a power vacuum between his longtime friend Leon Trotsky and Joseph Stalin. Lenin would say neither men were ready for the job. Right? Stalin is a brute thug, and, and, and you know Trotsky has just has tunnel vision. Trotsky, however, was head of the Communist um, Party. Um, Trotsky was an accomplished motivational speaker and a firm believer in Marxism. And he was the one that had stood by Lenin and helped him bring about the, the, the revolution. Now, Stalin was none of this, but he was a master recruiter. He got people in to the party. But Lenin actually calls Stalin an easily confused child who did not know how to use the power he wielded. And Lenin knew that if Stalin came to power, man, all right, Russia's got to be careful. But Stalin was a good organizer and a manipulator within the party. And after the death of Lenin, Trotsky and Stalin were maneuvering to become the new leader of the country. The 
two guys also have different ideological ideas on what they want to do. Trotsky wanted to return to its roots and start a worldwide revolution against capitalism. We want to strike out, we want to go out, we want to export communism to the world. Stalin says, ah, you know, I don't know. And he slowly manipulates the minds and hearts of the Russian people. And Stalin says, why worry about exporting to the world when we've got our own problems here at home? So before we go messing in other people's business, let's solve the problems that we have. Look at every the problems that were created when we meddled in war to, world affairs. When we got involved in World War I, all this stuff happened. And so Stalin very deftly maneuvers his backers into top positions in the Communist Party and Army. Slowly but surely, Trotsky is being maneuvered out. He is sent into exile, where one day he wakes up into wakes up in Mexico where he's exiled with an ice pick stuck in the back of his head. He was murdered by Stalin's secret police. And while the rest of the world is in the Great Depression, Stalin's going to take over Russia. And world events, once again, are about to collide as the Great Depression and the unsettled Treaty of Versailles and the mistrust of communism will lead people to World War II. But during the Depression, when everyone else was stuck, Russia makes great gains. They're like, look, communism is actually working. Look at what we're doing. But if you look at it, yeah, everyone else was up here. And while they were stuck in the Depression, Russia was making great gains. But yeah, they were so far behind. It looks good. But in reality, they've got so much to gain. Right? They are not doing well at all. So yes, we're making great progress, but yeah, even though we're stuck at 70%, you're still only on 12. Yeah, you made a 12% jump, but you started from nowhere. And Stalin will use terror and intimidation to sustain his economic growth. But by 1929, when the new policies don't work, Stalin says, oh, I've got a new idea. I want to switch to rapid industrialization. I want to do things overnight. This is actually something he blatantly stole from Leon Trotsky. And he said, the reason why we're still star starving is it's the farmer's fault. The stupid farmers aren't farming, so we are going to confiscate all of their land. And he creates a thing known as a five-year plan, right? And there was a government agency known as the Gauss Plan. What they did was they set up quotas. In five years, you are going to make this much. This is how much you are going to produce. And this was set up to feed the workers. Farmers, you're going to grow enough food to feed this many workers. And this many workers, you're going to create this many products. And all of this looks good on a spreadsheet, but the people in these planning commissions, the Gauss plan, didn't know how long it would take to grow that food. There was no infrastructure to take the food from the farmers to the industrial workers. And the industrial workers may have had food, but there was no way to get enough raw materials to the industrial workers to make their products. So it looks good. A goes to B, food goes to the workers, Raw materials go to the workers, the workers eat, they work, they produce this. A goes to B, B goes to C, um, C goes to D. But it doesn't work. It really doesn't work. These goals were set, but nothing, nothing um, was helping. And afraid that he was going to lose control after switching from Leninist views Stalin undergoes a purge where he kills off all of his rivals, his perceived rivals, even his own supporters, and most of his generals. And the problem with this is it ends right at the beginning of World War II. 
So when Germany attacks Russia and the great Operation Barbarossa, the Russians will be used up trying to slow them down because they've got no good leadership. So the last thing we are going to talk about, all right, here is the ideological farmer out there, you know, farming, all the workers in industrial assembly lines eating the farmers out there doing their job. Yeah, that really doesn't work. Here are three things we got to know in the 20th century. Totalitarian, a government where there is no civil rights. The government has total control. All opposition is suppressed. This is like Joseph Stalin. This is like Saddam Hussein. Suppression of everything. Sort of totalitarian, but a little bit different, is a fascist. Where the government is built on extreme nationalism. And nationalism, you've got to listen to me, your leader. I know who is to blame for your problems. Peaceful countries were weak. It's war. It's power. This is what is going to win. This is like Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini in Italy. And then Hitler takes fascism and ratchets it up into national Nazism. Nazism all right, is a brand of fascism that Hitler talks about in his book Mein Kampf, where he hates anybody who's not German. The French especially the Jews, and they're going to be the scapegoat for Germany's problems, and they're going to lead us into World War II. We also have a fascist in Italy with Benito um, Mussolini, and over in Japan we have another one in Hideki Tojo, who is going to lead everybody into war. And so here is some pictures of the Spanish Civil War that I'll probably tell you about in class. And one last very thing um, is that when we start looking at this in the sociological um, ideas, the Bolsheviks will create the longest lasting 20th century authoritarian government. From 1917 all the way to late 1989, 1990, Russia is a communist state. But they realize that it doesn't work. Okay, guys, that's a quick look at the Russian Revolution. It's a quick look at um, Trotsky, Lenin, and Stalin. No one's going to watch this, but you can't say that I didn't put it up there.